riding buddies. Over the last few videos, I've been following what started out as Emaki. This time, I'm going to take a sidestep and talk about Husserberg, or as some places in the world call it, Husserberg. Depends on what country you're in. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. It's a proven fact that subscribing will help you clear a trial section. Also, send a like. If you've not seen my last two videos, be sure to check them out. The Emaki and Kagiva stories do lead into the Husserberg story as well. I'll pick this history report up after the Castelloni brothers, or better known as the Kagiva company, buy out the Husqvarna factory in 1987. The Husserberg story really kicks off in 1988 when a group of former engineers from the old Husqvarna factory didn't want to leave Sweden for Italy. They got together and registered the company. The name comes from the town where it was born. It was made official when entering an enduro they had to put down a brand. Funding for this new manufacturer was very small. So small in fact that the first factory was set up in a woodshed. They couldn't afford to go out and spend huge amounts of money on established big name riders to race their bikes. So they put their efforts into young up and coming riders and relied on the ground braking technology to sell bikes. Doing this gave some young riders who became icons in the sport a start. Pity manufacturers don't do this now. They only want to take on riders who have already made a name for themselves. The early development of the Husserberg engine was even used in a Husqvarna chassis. The main objective of the Husserberg design was minimizing weight, and this was what they were known for, the lightest big bore four-stroke in their class. Their four-stroke engine technology obviously derived from the owner's past with Husqvarna, basing their new monster engine off the Husqvarna TE510. Four strokes were their focus until 2011. They even used the cam chain as the oil pump like the Husky engine. This was an ingenious idea to cut down weight and remove the mechanical pump. Unfortunately, it was not a very reliable system. This did create engine failures. The TE510 engine was much improved for the Husserberg. A shorter stroke and a nickel cylinder were some of the changes in helping to reduce engine weight and increase performance. The frame had many unusual features as well. The very large and rigid spine was the airbox and the air pickup, being a ram air system. This had the benefit of forcing colder air than a regular design into the back of the Mycuni carburetor. In the early days, the Swedish military even used Husserberg, just like they did with the Husqvarna when they developed their automatic transmission. In my Kagiva video, I told you about Husqvarna winning the World 500 Motocross GP in 1993. Well, Husserberg took this even further, winning the championship in 95, 97 and 1998. Yamaha gets undeserved credit for the birth of the current four-stroke domination. But I'm going to go on a limb and say it was actually Husqvarna and Husserberg. These two manufacturers built four-strokes that were more than capable of beating the two-strokes. In Enduro, they also showed they were an extremely competitive manufacturer. In 1990, 91, 95, 96 and 1998, Husserberg took out the World Enduro Championships. A big ask when you take into consideration that the best enduro bikes in the world at the time were mainly European brands, beating them on their home soil as a relatively newcomer. Components in the new Husserberg were top of the shelf. The white power 4054 forks were the duck's guts as far as these new upside down forks were concerned. White power rear suspension was the best you could buy. Acherbys supplied the plastics. 
Brembo stopped the new beast. Every bolt-on component was the best money could buy. Even the engine and chassis contained the best quality technology in their manufacturing process. The only problem with all this technology and top-of-the-shelf components was the cost. The Husseberg, when released, was something like 25% more expensive than the next most expensive big ball four-stroke in its class at the time. Husseberg kept their model range small, starting with one model, the Enduro FE501. They did expand into the motocross and motard worlds as well, with capacities ranging from 350 to 650 cc, always keeping with the four-stroke engine. This was until KTM bought them out in 1995. Husseberg remained in Sweden, sort of running as their own company until 2003, when KDM moved almost everything to Austria, only leaving the motorsport section in Sweden. In 2009, Husseberg released their most earth-shattering design since the brand was released in 1989. The new bikes had looked like they had allowed the first year apprentices to assemble them and they put the engine in upside down and back to front. This new design was their way of getting the weight centered in the overall design. It worked. The new design only lasted until 2012. After 2012, Husserbergs became a slight variation of the KDM. From 2012 to 2014, the mighty Husseberg was another version of the KDM parent company. KDM purchased Husqvarna in 2013, with the Husqvarna name replacing Husseberg in 2015. Unfortunately, since 2014, there has been no Husseberg. KDM still owns the name, but has shelved it. Maybe one day we might see the Husseberg name again, like now we see SWM, but it doesn't look likely in the near future. Imagine some rich enthusiast buying the Husseberg name and going back to the old woodshed in Sweden and starting production all over again. When I started this story, I thought, yeah, this will be a walk in the park. They don't chop and change like Kagiva did, and it's not that far back in time as Air Mackey. But in reality, information is not easy to find on Husseberg. Be sure to check out all my other videos as well, especially the videos on Air Mackey and Kagiva, as these are like a small lead into Husseberg. You may even enjoy that video that has just popped up as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time.